everybody. Welcome to Conversations in Anarchy. My name is Katherine Gleich, and I am this year's co-producer of Anarchapoco 2020. We are so excited to have you joining us tonight. This conversation series was created to bring the community together. We all love coming together in February, and this is an opportunity to get to know each other and start building deeper relationships now. Tonight on the call, I have two Anarchapoco fabulous team members, Angel and David. Would the two of you please introduce yourself? Angel, welcome. Hey there, Kat. I am Angel. Uh, I am working with David on the Free Your Family Camp, producing lots of fantastic um, events for kids and families. I am the editor of the Anarchist Guide to the Galaxy and editor of the Anarchopocal blog and freedom lover, freedom fighter, <laughs> and all-around advocate for liberty. Awesome. Yes, my name is David Rodriguez. As um, these fine ladies mentioned, helping to uh, co-produce the Free Your Family Camp stage. Been going to Narcopogo every year since its inception. I love freedom. I love the people. I love the, the hope that I have, the optimism that I gain there. I'm also principal of a private school that focuses on accelerated graduation and homeschooling consulting to get these kids out of these day prisons and start to focus on their own passions and interests and dreams. And today we're talking about money. So I'm so excited to be with you all and uh, have a great conversation. Awesome. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for everything you're doing for our community and for our event. As David said, tonight we are talking about money, which is such an intricate and fascinating topic to talk about. It's one of the most talked about things at Anarchapoco. In fact, it's something that we have an entire stage devoted to with CryptoPoco and the Dollar Vigilante Summit, which takes place before. So tonight we're going to be talking about anarchy and money, financial systems, banks, money, cryptocurrency, and financial autonomy. But first, some housekeeping. <laughs> we're going to try to keep this to an hour. Hey, Verity, thanks for joining us again. We are going to be trying to keep this to an hour, but if the conversation is rolling, we're going to roll with you. So with that being said, please participate. If you're on the Zoom, turn on your camera if you feel comfortable. We would love to see your beautiful faces. When the time comes, if you have questions or comments, you can turn on your mic with the camera or without. You can also comment in the chat section here on the Zoom. And if you happen to be on Facebook or DLive or YouTube or any of our other streaming locations, you can chat there too. And we have moderators paying attention and they will bring your questions up during the live call. So with that being said, Tonight, we're going to be talking about the key points. We're going to do a little round robin between the three of us here, and then we're going to really start diving into it, and we welcome you, all of your participation. So, okay, one last reminder is that we practice and believe in nonviolent communication. So even if you disagree with someone, this has not been an issue in the past, try to speak lovingly. That is how we want to communicate here on this call. Hi, Ken. Thank you for coming back. I'm sure you're going to have a lot to contribute tonight. Also, as a read along for this series that we're doing, we are using the Anarchist Guide to the Galaxy, which is a fantastic ebook written by Evan and David. And it was edited by Angel, a lot of time and energy and the graphics were by Kelsey. I mean, this book is awesome. If you haven't had the chance to check it out, please check out anarchapoco.com and download the ebook today. So today we're going to be talking about anarchy and money. And David, I thought it would be a really good opportunity for you to talk about the history of banking. Yeah, this is, as we were saying earlier, it's kind of a heavy subject because, you know, we go through government schools and they give us the civics class and all these numbers, but effectively money is one of the most important things in our lives because it's a medium of exchange. This is what it is because uh, there is also a method called bartering. Why would you can like transfer if you want a goat and I got a chicken, we can transfer and trade, which is great if, uh, you know, I want chickens and you want goats. But if we want something else, then how do we do that? And so this is where money came from. And of course, gold is always known as money because that became the medium of exchange that was acceptable and other coins and these types of things. And then if you actually look into some of the, the old photos of money, the coins had a hole in it like this. And the reason is they would put string through these coins 
and they would lug their money around. It's like that scene or the, the show Seinfeld where Kramer's running around with the pennies in his cargo pants and he like brings all the pennies and throws it on there. It's heavy. It's burdensome. You know, people don't want to do that. And so uh, what they started doing is they started taking this money, giving it to the goldsmith. Let's say the gold coins and the goldsmith. And he would give you a certificate and say, yes, it's true that uh, Catherine has, you know, 50 um, ounces of gold there. And then you could transact giving that paper back and forth, which is convenient. And anytime you want the gold, you go get the gold. Well, these smart guys realize, hey, these people are not coming to get their gold. They're just exchanging these pieces of paper. And so they start to loan other people's gold out and they were starting to make an interest on it. This is known as now as required reserves. And so now anytime you put a hundred dollars in a bank, they can actually lend out $900. So it's a 10% required reserve rates in general. And so they started doing that. And then, um, these banks started going under these banks would, would lend out too much money. They would make bank runs. The people say, I want my money back. You know, like, what are you doing? And these banks started to crash. And so, um, these wise guys, you might know the Rockefellers and, um, Rothschilds, these types of people, the Warburgs, they started saying, what if we could become the central bank? And they started doing that in England and all around the world. And the, the reference I would give you is the creature from Jekyll Island. This is the, uh, former anarcho speaker, multi-speaker, G. Edward Griffin. And the Federal Reserve Bank that we have today is a private institution that um, the, the United States Treasury borrows money from. And this is the, the printer of the money. So really a, a crack system, profitable system for them. And I just want to read you one quote. I don't want to get too heavy into it, but uh, understanding that this system is a private system. And so he talks about the the creature from Jekyll Island because Jekyll Island is where they wrote the Federal Reserve Act from 1913. And here, this quote, I'm going to give you some of the names of the people that were part of this gathering because it was so secret uh, because they have tried to uh, create central banks in the past, but they failed. Um, you know, Andrew Jackson shot them down and other types. Of, people were suspicious of uh, these uh, centralized banking systems. And so, uh, this was known as the Aldrich Plan, A-L-D-R-I-C-H. He was a senator. And in this train, this train car, this is the quote from the book here. It says, and so as the passengers drifted off to sleep to the rhythmic clicking of the steel heels against the rail, little did they dream riding the, the car at the end of their train were six men who represented an estimated one-fourth of the total wealth of the entire world. This was the roster of the Aldrich car that night. Nel Nelson W. Aldrich, Republican whip in the Senate, chairman of the National Monetary Commission, business associate of J.P. Morgan, father-in-law to J John D. Rockefeller Jr. Next, you have Abraham Piat Andrew, assistant secretary of the U.S. Treasury. Next, Frank A. Vanderlip, president of the National City Bank of New York, the most powerful of banks at the time, representing William Rockefeller and the International Investment Baking House of Kuhn, Loeb, and Company. Next, you have Henry P. Davison, senior partner of the J.P. Morgan Company. You have Benjamin Strong, head of J.P. Morgan's trust company. And then you have Paul Warburg, partner in Kuhn and Loeb and Company, representative of the Rothschild banking dynasty in England and France, and brother to Max Warburg, who was head of the Warburg Banking Consortium in Germany and the Netherlands. So if you caught the first part of the quote, these six guys represented one-fourth of the total wealth on planet Earth. And so they were colluding, and one of the reasons they do that, just like state, the, the state in general is a monopoly, because when you have a monopoly, you have no competition. Nobody can compete with you. And so that's what this whole system is about. And that's why we're promoting freedom. We're promoting choice and voluntary um, interactions because that's moral. But these guys use the threat of violence to not even have competing currencies. And uh, maybe some of our audience or, or you, Angel and Cat, know better than I, but uh, there was like the Liberty Dollar. There's other currencies. You're not allowed to use other currencies because they want the full monopoly of that. So this goes back. And there's more, more important dates as well. Um, going up past 1913, 1933, and 1971, 
where they actually took the U.S. dollar completely off the gold standard. So now the, you, the, the money you have in your pocket is a piece of paper. It's not tied to anything. Um, I have some of the dollars that said uh, a silver certificate, and you could actually trade that in and go get silver. Now it's a piece of paper. You, just like a, a printer on your computer, you go file print. It's a piece of paper. And so this is what Voltaire said. He said, all paper money eventually go to their, in their inherent worth, which is nothing. So this is why it's very exciting to have this conversation, just to give you a background of where the uh, money came from and where we're at now in history. And they just keep pumping the money for the system and they got to fund the wars. I think they're printing out like a hundred billion dollars that every couple of weeks now through like the quantitative easing. Now we're at a very vo volatile time in the monetary system. And so it's great to have this conversation now with all of you. And uh, I'm curious that uh, maybe Angel, you might have something to add and contribute as we expand kind of the maybe present time and some of the other comments for today. Yeah, for sure. So I, I was a libertarian during the Ron Paul days. And, you know, so I, and I came from the left and I had this idea that I really want to help the poor. I really want to help everyone. How can we be strong? How can we be successful? How can we, you know, have financial stability? And so uh, Ron Paul was talking about these things and he gave me an idea of how we actually build a society um, that is based on the strong fundamental financial system. And then the, so from Ron Paul, I got introduced to Murray Rothbard. And I read, uh, a friend of mine told, told me to read What Is Government Done With Our Money? And that was the moment. Like, I finished that book, and I was like, I'm an anarchist now. <laughs> I'm an anarchist now. So what I, what I like about this book um, – and about the subject in general is that we don't really have an understanding of what money is for a lot of us. We don't understand where it comes from. We just kind of get pushed, we, you know, born into the system and we take for granted that these dollars mean something. We kind of trade with them. What does it mean that they don't have any real value? You can buy things with them. How is it manipulated? And so connecting with this idea of what money actually is um, and how it came into being was really important for me. So I just want to, as you touched on that, I really want to drive it home that what's happening when people trade, right? We, you know, it, what makes sense normally is that there's a barter system, right? We are all individually doing our own things and we have access to different resources depending on who we are, where, where we are and what kinds of activities we engage in. So I might have something um, of value and you might have something of value and we can and and we want to trade right you want to share with me what you have and i'll share with you what you have and that's great but there are some times when i have something you have something i need something that you don't um that you don't have but you have what i want right so let's say let's say we live in a fishing village right and i i have a boat <laughs> um, and you have a paddle, <laughs> right? You have many paddles. I have many boats. This is perfect. We both need something that the other has, but it's so infrequent that that actually is what happens. What tends to happen is you have things, I have things, and there's not really what we call the co coincidence of wants. And so what happens? Well, how do we trade? How do we, how do we have an economy? And so what if we live in a fishing village, for instance, one of the things that might be a common need between the two of us is fishing hooks, right? So you might not want to trade, you know, I might not want to accept something from you that I have no value for, like a tractor, um, but I might say, well, I really need a, a fishing paddle. You don't have those, but you have fishing hooks. I'll take the fishing hooks, give you what you need, and then I'll take those fishing hooks to someone else who does have a, a, um, what I need and give it to them. And so what happens over time is that there are, there are some things in society that everybody needs. It might be rice. It might be fishing hooks. It might be um, just whatever the common thing is that we all use. 
And that becomes the thing that is easiest to trade around. And so for all intents, it becomes the money. It becomes the medium of exchange. It's the thing that has real value to people. And it has real value to a lot of people because it, there's a use for it. It's what we call a commodity, right? And so that that's, that's how money comes into being. And it, it really just is about adoption over time, more and more people viewing it that way. What happens though <laughs> is that when governments get involved and they see the I mean and there's such a huge I, I don't want to get into the weeds because there's so much information to give but over time gold and silver are the things that became really just the medium of exchange that you could trade around um, you know through diverse um, communities cultures um, and so but what happened with gold is that the government decided that it needed to control the economy, right? That it needed to, I mean, and it's hard to say why, right? We could, we could, we could talk about the Rothschilds and people like that and, the, and, and ascribe some sort of negative, negative intention. Um, there are arguments to be made about liquidity and the ideas of keeping a stable economy, but there are also people who want to use the resources of others um, to fund the things that they care about. And so with government, what they started to do was to debase currency, right? To be debase gold, to take small portions of gold away from coins um, and to use it and not really, and, and to use it for the things that they needed because it's easier to kind of take a little bit of value than it is to, to tax people because when people are taxed, they see it directly and they start, and there, are, there have been revolutions fought all over the world in all times about taxation. But this, this thing, this, uh, this like surreptitious way to steal value from people through just taking small bits of the coin, that's what government started to do. Um, but that has its own problems. There are limitations on that because people start to see what's happening. And so what government really needed to do was disconnect the value of gold or disconnect gold from the, the bank notes, which is what um, what you were talking about. So I feel like there's so much that I'm not saying, and I don't want it to get too much in the weeds and then not have you guys be able to follow. But ultimately what we have now is a system where the money is disconnected from anything at all. And it allows for the government to print and print and create more and more and more in the society. And what they want to do is increase spending and they do do that. But what they also do is increase prices and people don't understand that the money that these prices that they're seeing in the economy, um, rising prices and everything from healthcare to the cost of food are really the result of government coming in and manipulating the money. And while, and, and it's a tax, really. It's a tax on the people without them being able to understand the tax, without them being able to fight the tax. And so that's, that's kind of the, the, short, the short of it. And what we advocate is a, well, you know, what we advocate is competition, right? Hey, David, like if you just had competition, like if you want to have the Federal Reserve and you want to have your fiat money and you want to back it by nothing, that's fine. Go ahead. You do that. And if people want to accept it, then that's fine. But there should be other forms, other forms of money that are legal because what happens is they make everything else legal. So we right. can't decide what we trade with. It's we a cartel. They have to let the cartel. They, they force you to use their money. It's like, just let us use our money and like, let it all be, let us use shells and like rocks or, you know, let us use that. They say, no, it's like legal tender. They have all these legal tender laws. And it's like, it's the most craziest thing that they're forcing us to use their piece of paper that aren't worth anything <laughs> except okay, we I, got faith. We got faith. Go I ahead, want Gavin. to clarify here real quick. They're trying to force us by making laws, right? Mm. The fact of the matter is no one has come and held a gun to my head telling me that I can't barter, I can't trade. Now, it is legal to create silver coins. You can't call them the dollar. And that's where the Liberty dollar 
sort of made a mistake, right? So, you know, there's like the, um, there's, there's like little square prints, you can get the round prints, there's all sorts of different shapes of coins that you can get now that are minted now, there's historical ones, I'm really getting into like international coin collection. When I was in Mexico, I started buying some South American silver, and I'm really excited about the diversity of my coin collection. Now, I like silver special printed for collecting because they're beautiful to me and they're wonderful and yes they store value that i can possibly pass down to my children but our money did used to be made out of actual silver like you were saying david and you can still get a hold of this it's called junk silver in the silver trading industry and you can look up a silver trader in your community call them up, say, I'd like to buy some junk silver. And they may have a minimum amount that you have to spend. But, you know, when I got a settlement from a police department for an unlawful arrest, I went and got a big old bag of junk silver, right? I figured I'm going to take this money and invest in my future. And when I needed it, it was there and it had appreciated. And of course, markets fluctuate, right? But the reason I bring this up is that when I first started getting into sound money, real money, because of Dr. Ron Paul, my ex and I had created this little barter pamphlet called the Black and Yellow Pages. And we went around to farmer's markets and businesses in Austin, and we asked if they would accept silver. Now, at the time, I was like, no to Bitcoin because I didn't really understand it. And someone asked if we could put it on there. And I'm like, this needs to be like for, you know, if shit, it's the fan. I want to make sure I can, you know, actually have a physical good to barter. Now, eventually we did include crypto onto it, but we were able to create a little micro economy in Austin of businesses and people and individuals who were willing to accept actual silver. We bought groceries. We, Here's an interesting barter that I did. I bartered a whole chicken raised on our farm in exchange to have my first Bitcoin wallet set up on my computer, an Electrum wallet. <laughs> so I think that's a pretty cool barter. Um, so the point I want to make is that, yes, they are going to try to regulate money. They do. And they manipulate it. But freedom is always oozing around the cracks, kind of like water and air, right? You can't contain it. It doesn't matter how many walls you build or seals you make, eventually water's gonna seep through. Same thing with freedom, it's gonna seep through. And so these black and gray markets, this black and gray economy of barter, of trade, this is known as agorism. And this is sort of the unregulated market. It can be gray, it can be black, you know, it can be kind of one foot in the door. You can be an agorist and still trade in USD if that's what you choose. So I'm personally a fan of decentralizing your income and decentralizing the type of money that you're using and decentralizing your economy. It's really awesome to find people who will barter with you. I know that there is the Austin timeshare. Verity's talked about the gift economy. So there's all sorts of different ways that we can exchange. Angel, what were you wanting to say? So here's the one thing, though. This is how they get you. <laughs> is The legal tender laws makes it so that you can't pay... Well, one, you can't create a banking system based on any of these other currencies, but it also means you can't pay your taxes. You can't, you know, so the, the government levies taxes on you and then makes this one thing legal tender. And so it creates a demand for this specific fiat money. And so now you're trapped in the system. So like, think about it, property taxes, right? Agorism is really great. But let's say you learn, let's say you use no US dollars and then you, but you decide to own property. Um, and let's say somehow you <laughs> could, you know, barter for the property, but like you have your property, um, you have to pay property taxes and you have to pay mm. that in US dollars. So now Oof. you need to go out into the world and get US dollars. And it's why property tax is really my least favorite tax. I think it is the most offensive tax because it keeps you tied into the system your entire life. You can never attain any freedom from the system because you have to keep giving the government its due. 
right? And so that's the problem with legal tender laws is that even though there are ways to circumvent it on a small scale, there aren't ways to circumvent it on a, well, maybe there are, maybe crypto might be the thing. I'm not sure, right? Like we'll, we're seeing if there's going to be that massive adoption and it isn't a commodity money. So we'll see like what that really means. I have some questions and maybe Kim can answer them in a bit about um, the feasibility of crypto. But um, but that the property taxes, the legal tender laws. And so and I'll say this, too, um, about being an anarchist and everyone thinks that you want to destroy things. And 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 but I think we can circumvent government. And so we don't have to we don't have to advocate for people to get rid of the Federal Reserve or anything like that. All we need to do is advocate for a little more liberty, right? Like if there, if there were to me was a law passed that just said any, everything else would, um, is like you can create your own banking system, right? If they just allowed for more competition, then I think we would solve a lot of the problems. But of course they won't do that because they need to be able to manipulate the money supply to do the things that they want to do, like wage wars and create a welfare state and all of those things. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Big I, violence is big business and they need an unlimited printing press to be able to do that. Hey, yesterday was, you know, Veterans Day. I posted some stuff about Smedley Butler, right? He's the most decorated Marine, you know, served 33 years. And he finally realized I was representing Wall Street. I was representing these, these special financial interests at the end of his career. He, he realized this. And that was in 1925. And so here we are almost 100 years later. So this is why I think it's really important for us to bring up the fact that it is about money, the military industrial complex, going and killing people so that these few guys that I just mentioned who own these banks, these guys are making the money. And what I love about what you just said, Catherine, it gives me the quote from Ayn Rand, who I know she's not like anarchist, but she's, I would say, pro-freedom in some way. She said, it's not who's going to let me, it's who's going to stop me, right? And so rather than having to ask for permission, it's we have to, the Buckminster Fuller quote, to make a model that makes the other model obsolete where they can't even get in. And this is why I'm so hopeful in crypto because well, even there's Bitcoin and there's another coin called Monero where like, it's like a, a dark wallet. They can't even see it. And so I'm like, is this true? Like, I, you know, I get kind of intimidated by all the tech stuff behind the scenes, but I'm like, you know, philosophically trying to understand if we can exchange, let's say between two people and they can't see what we, who we are, what we bought, or anything like that. I mean, this would be wonderful to do that because they're not going to give us our freedom, you know. And so, for some of the new viewers, my definition: the state is intergenerational organized crime, and so they wrap it up with the flag, and so we feel patriotism and we feel we feel love for it. And me too. I grew up in Smallville, California, and like, yeah, the best country in the world, and public schools, and all this baloney. And then you find out there's other human beings who believe the same thing about their country. And it's like, what's going on here, guys? Well, it's nationalism. And if we can get to the point where it's about individualism, where you're the king or queen of your own sovereign body, and so am I, and this is the way we can inter interact. And then if we want to do business, let's do a contract. Oh, I love what you say, Catherine, about you have my, ch I have a chicken. Help me get a, a Bitcoin wallet and a Bitcoin. Done. That's the transaction. That's it. We don't got to pay nobody taxes. We don't have to do anything for some third party. So to have the conscious intention to X out these parties, I think they're becoming very concerned. I'm, I mean, maybe this is maybe a digression, but like about how Wall Street might be getting into the depths of Bitcoin um, because they're realizing, you know, there was a, I think it was a, a state senator. He might've been a, a, a congressman on the national level, but um, this is maybe two or three months ago. And he's like, well, if they do the, the cryptocurrency, we can't take the money. You know, we got to make a law that says, you know, we can stop them. <laughs> and I saw Jeff Berwick, you know, the founder of Anarcha Fogo. He's like, these guys are hilarious, man. They don't understand. They can't take the wallet. They can't take it. What they could do is kind of see the, the, um, the digits or the, um, the wallet identification, but how to find that person is a whole different issue. So, and this is a whole nother issue about identification. But I love it that you said freedom's always trying to ooze around. And this is kind of the really powerful the, the point of cryptocurrency and blockchain is that we're not asking for permission. We're just going to try to build this world and build a little local community and wherever we can internationally and locally. And you guys try to catch up because, you know, politics is 
and strength and culture and actual community. And so, so the innovators are on this call, watching this now and later, creating solutions, the entrepreneurs, the investors with capital who are trying to make uh, something work better. And so this is why, you know, this is why we're here talking about money. Yes. So, okay. So hold on. Before we move forward, I just want to give a shout out to all of the international people attending this call because the three of us here, we're from the United States. We have a very U.S. perspective. But I want to note that we've got Michael and Ken coming from Mexico. We've got Verity coming from Belize. We've got Danny coming from the Netherlands. So you guys probably have a different history from your community. And I would definitely be interested in hearing more about that. With that being said, we have Ken Code on the call. He is very into crypto. He has this amazing wallet called the Palm Pay Wallet, which allows you to spend multiple currencies at different shopping locations. And I don't know, Ken, if you're willing to you know, talk about that and how that helps to liberate people economically. Sure, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, um, boy, where do you start? You know, this getting into crypto is a huge jump, but if you think about this, just think of crypto kind of like the money that you have in your wallet right now, or well, the money that you have in a bank account right now, because if you kind of, I don't want to be dumb, but if you dumb it down for most people to think of it in a way where the money that you put into a bank becomes digital anyways. It's just digits on a screen, right? Mm -hmm. So, but with crypto, it, it's, it's all backed up by cryptography. So basically, the money that you have, you have. It's not somebody holding it for you. Um, uh, guys, I can't remember who was it. There was, maybe it was Trace Mayer's thing. Um, not your keys, not your coins or something like that. With crypto, you actually get to hold your own money. And this is extremely important because as long as somebody else is controlling your money, you are essentially a slave to the current monetary system. So the whole point of us kind of being here, right, is to talk about freedom and to, you know, get us out of this mess instead of fighting the system and, you know, going downtown where all the protests are and all this kind of stuff. Just step to the side. You know what I'm saying? Like just instead of trying to fight all this stuff, just say, okay, how am I going to create or use my own money that I can control and, or maybe even your own energy? Because that's like another major topic for me is um, permaculture stuff. But controlling your own money is extremely important. So, yeah. And when you're looking at cryptos, and just, just to kind of throw this disclaimer out there, this isn't advice. This is just my opinions on these different things. But when you're looking at different cryptos, you really got to look and see, okay, which ones are actually decentralized? Because that, in my opinion, is probably the most important thing. And the big buzzword right now is, oh, it's a dApp, it's a dApp, it's a decentralized application. Well, no, it isn't. In my opinion, decentralized apps don't even exist yet. Okay, if you're relying on app stores for their approval, if you're relying on HTTP protocol, if you're relying on DNS in any way, you know, these kind of things, then you're not a DAP yet. Okay, and that's what I focus on is creating applications, apps and other things like CIPFS and stuff like that, that are not reliant on the old system at all. You've got to completely remove yourself from this. And at the same time, making it grandma friendly too. So trying to find... Um, <laughs> You know, apps and stuff out there that, you know, my grandma would want to use is extremely difficult. So that's what I do is I make, you know, wallets like the Bitsy wallet and point of sale systems like Palm Pay and um, CIPFS and stealth transactions on the BitShares chain. Um, another really important thing that you've got to consider is, and also my opinion, is the fact that it's going to become increasing, increasingly more difficult to buy cryptos and to trade them. And we all know that centralized exchanges suck, right? So how do we do that? Well, atomic swaps. In my opinion, atomic swaps are the future. Where I can trade with you and you can trade with me. There's nobody in the middle at all. Not a bridge, not an exchange, not even a decentralized exchange. You're just going through an atomic swap only, either through HTLC, ILP, IBC, whatever, whatever protocol you use. But um, you've got to really think about this. So... 
um, earning crypto is going to become like, man, think about earning crypto. So get on whale shares and steam and library, which is LBRY.io, bittubers.com, um, float. You know, there's a bunch of different places where you can go and earn cryptos right now. This is just so easy. Just post quality stuff. You know, don't spam the, the site or whatever, but post stuff that people actually want to read or look at or learn from you. You know, you've got something that you know that nobody else is good at. So just freaking post it. You know, like my wife, for example, she cooks like everything on the planet. And it's just, that's the kind of stuff that like, man, that's actually worth like a couple of bucks. Just posting the photos of it, if nothing else, online. So all of those cryptos, and if, if, if you're in any of those communities right now, I beg of you to implement atomic swaps on your chain, please. Because then we can add you to the Pompeii point of sale systems so that the people who are earning all those cryptos can start spending them at brick and mortar stores. Like we got over 30 businesses um, here in just Acapulco alone already um, in just the first year, like restaurants, hotels, all the nightclubs pretty much. Um, I mean, you come to Acapulco, man, you're going to be able to take a taxi, pay crypto. You're going to go to your hotel, pay crypto, eat out. I mean, just like everything you want to do, go to the bungee jumping thing or the zip line or whatever. It, we got you covered, man. I mean, this is where it's at. You earn crypto and you can be able to spend it. So you're, you are, you're free. Ken. Yes, absolutely, Ken. I'm so grateful for you bringing this up. I want to note for everybody, coinmap.org is a website where you can go see who is taking crypto around the world and what currencies they are accepting. And something that I think is really important that Ken tapped onto is that with this atomic swaps, it's a direct transfer. Well, that's what barter is and that's what trading silver is. And I think that the lowest common denominator, the more you can cut out the middleman, the better. So one of the greatest barter exchanges that I have ever had in my life, one of the greatest tools for barter has been the use of eggs when I had chickens. I could trade a dozen eggs, two dozen eggs, five dozen eggs, a slaughtered chicken for just about anything. I had photography portraits done for our family when my son was born, okay? So barter, it doesn't just have to be cryptocurrency. It doesn't just have to be, you know, silver coins and things like that. You can actually trade marijuana, trade tobacco. Think about when all hell breaks loose, the electricity goes off, there's snow outside. What do people need? These are things that you can use as a currency of exchange. Bottled water, cigarettes, lighters, light bulbs, whatever. These are things that people need to exchange. So Angel, I know that you were wanting to say something. You want to chime in? Yeah, a couple. <laughs> I, so many things. <laughs> um, but and this might and I wanted to definitely like direct this a little bit toward Ken. Um, um with respect to the, the crypto. So from YouTube, we have a comment or a question from Toothpick. That's what do you guys think about governments in the world adopting cashless um, versus the cryptocurrency revolution? And I actually think, I mean, you, right, it would seem that there are some similarities. I would say governments adopting <laughs> cashless is as scary <laughs> as, um, as it is that they have dollars. It's just one more disconnection from um, from you having control over your money and also because of the political nature of government because um, I would be very I would be very wary of uh, of, of opting into any system and they never ask you to opt in <laughs> but I would be very wary of opting into any system where the government would be able to with the the uh, you know like the click of a switch wipe out my savings it really would be you i think you would see political control increase um beyond what we see out in the world today and so i would be very scared of that and cryptocurrency is different in that there is this blockchain and that and the information isn't centralized and so it's much more difficult to manipulate so i do think there that's valid but then i also think there are some valid um concerns about crypto um and, and this goes back to you talking about barter. What does happen, Ken, if the grid goes down? If, you know, you know there are all these war-torn countries and like well, now if all of my, if not maybe all of your 
savings or all of your money shouldn't be in any one currency. But let's say if, you know, we gain half ding, ding, ding. Dollars, so if That's, we a, gain that's half a great dollars. question, Angel. That's one of the most common questions in crypto, actually. Um, and in my opinion, yes, the grid is going to go down. So you're mm -hmm. starting to see blackouts all over the place. And personally, I just, you know, here's my tinfoil, but um, I think that it's actually part of the agenda to get us into this whole, like, oh, we, yeah, we're killing this, whatever, but it's the, the, the climate agenda and the, the carbon credits and the social credit scores and all this stuff ties in together. So, yeah. What do you <laughs> So yeah, it's a problem, right? It's it's a real problem, and you have to diversify. But I but I don't think like barter is very. I mean, yes, this is what you default to when the system breaks down. But the pro there is the problem with barter in that one. There's the coincidence of once. You know, you have to try. It's like it requires a lot of effort to try to find the things that you yeah. want, given what you have to give. And so like like it's not going to be the economic system you know, having money is what barter evolved into and, and allows for all of the diversity and all of the, and it allows for capitalism. It allows for us to have savings and to build upon that. Um, well, so, Angel, if so, I could, there's a lot of people don't realize that, that even when the grid goes down, the grid is going to come back up because they got to be able to communicate with each other too. And the mm -hmm. beautiful thing about blockchains is even when the power goes out or you shut down all the nodes, like let's just say, like all of the nodes in the world shut down all at the same time. Well, the power is going to come back on. And guess what? The chain is going to kick right back in where I left off. So, you know, <laughs> that, yeah. you're, you're, I'd, you're I'd like to touch on this. The, the whole time. If y'all don't mind, um, two things. One, of course, decentralizing all the things is great, right? So, of course, you want to decentralize what types of money you're utilizing. So, when the grid is down, it's good to have junk silver. And here's why. Junk silver is easy to verify that it's real in a situation where you don't have a silver store, silver inspector, because mm -hmm. it's printed by government right but it's yep. it's standardized and you know easily by looking at it touching it hearing the clink that it makes that it's legitimate there are often you know fake monies that are made on fake coins and it's easier in a crisis situation for that to happen and you know when the grid goes down it's good to have access to these types of ways to barter but when the grid is up gosh it is so nice to be able to use crypto and bitcoin <laughs> and to send transactions across borders and to have this freedom that a piece of silver doesn't really provide you so decentralizing is really important i see that michael nimitz has his hand up michael would you like to chime in We can't hear you. If you're talking, you are on mute. Let's see. <laughs> Hello, guys. Can you hear me now? Hi. Yes. Welcome. Hey, thank you so much. And once again, love what you guys are doing. Always uh, awesome. Uh, I just wanted to kind of add to some of the things that you're saying. And I think everything is, is right on the money. But I think there's even more um, recognition of value and stuff that once people start to use crypto and, and certainly at a, at a community level, we can create certain situations like even like coupons and stuff like that or coupon tokens that can represent value from like local stores and local products and services. And then we can also create distributed networks in which regardless of of the, the main network is up or down, we can still create transactions. And so, you know, kind of adopting crypto, adopting the, the circumstances and allowing people to understand what money really represents, which is just anything of value, that, and that anything of value can, can back up a, a currency or exchange like eggs or chickens or, or uh, you know, a, a person's time. All those things can back up a local currency, and as long as you know local merchants and people accept that as currency, that's that's enough. We don't really need the outside world when it comes to our local communities to 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 do anything. You know, we can essentially then just kind of create our own kind of anti-fragile system 
in which when the rest of the world's banking collapse happens or you know any of that other stuff happens we've already got something else that we can go to and just and, and nothing really changes and and the thing is is that you know kind of going into crypto and understanding you know what money is and what it really represents and having people get familiar with how to do those transactions and stuff I think is is really an opportunity where we can really start to educate people and then once we have a model that is like a community model it's something that can proliferate around the world and certainly with Anarchapoco if we can demonstrate that to the people that are coming to Anarchapoco and then have them spread out around the world with that kind of knowledge and information we can change the world almost overnight with you know what Ken is doing and and, uh, and you know what we're discussing yeah I want to add something that you said Michael and also with Ken because Ken you're creating relationships with vendors out there in Acapulco with beautiful so you kind of have a list of people that accept crypto so people that have crypto would be interested in knowing who accepts crypto the taxis the hotels the restaurants and anytime i go out anywhere for food out here in california i'm in san jose i always ask even, you know, even if i'm not in san jose i say do you guys accept bitcoin because i want to see how they respond when i ask them do you guys accept bitcoin and uh there's one particular <laughs> place i went like two days ago i asked the guy and he's like no nah, what's that i was like Man, it's 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 uh, currency the government doesn't control, and they pull out the money, and you can say, "Hey, look, the Federal Reserve. You know about the Federal Reserve? No, oh, it's a private bank, man. These guys just print money, and you kind of give them the education on the spot as best you can." And I told him what it is, and um, he's like, "He's like, so the government can't uh, can't see your bank account?" I say, "No." He's like, "I want one." So I got his information. I don't even sell these things, so maybe I should talk with you, Ken. Um, or there's another gentleman I spoke with at Anarca Vegas, Rodrigo. He's down in South America, and he was just game, going gangbusters, and he created this device, maybe something similar you have, but it's like for vendors, and it takes all these different currencies. And I was like, it's awesome. So how much would a business owner be interested in cutting out the documentation to the state or some other third party and then accepting the money as is for right now? That's what I'm very hopeful exactly. about. Exactly. You know, I mean, that's that's really what you're yeah. doing. So. Um, my guess is that is the, has the reception been pretty hard? I mean, despite the language barrier or what's some of the, I mean, they probably have no yeah. questions. They're like, they cut the government out. Like I want that thing now. <laughs> yeah. Um, adoption is slow because it, it's such an educational process. Just getting people to wrap their heads around, you know, what is crypto and why do I need this? And there's nothing wrong with the peso or the dollar or whatever. It's like, well, I'm kind of in tune to, you know, macroeconomics pretty heavily. So I can tell you that there's a lot wrong with it. And, you know, according to Bix Weir, we're already over 500 billion a day um, in bailouts just up in America. So yeah, it's, this is hardcore. Like if you're not getting, if you're not, you know, getting into some hard assets right now, like precious metals and cryptos, you're really, man, you're in trouble. You're really in trouble. I hate to yeah. say it, but. It's it's the way of the future. So Verity, Verity is wanting to chime in about the off-grid internet and apps. Um, Verity, are you? Do you have your mic um, unmuted? Are you able to talk? Hello, everybody. Hi, oh, I, I've got a lot to say. <laughs> this is a huge, huge subject, and um, gosh, y'all have touched on so many things. I'm like, yeah, yeah. You know, I love crypto. <laughs> I'll just get that out of the way. I love crypto because it circumvents the banks. And I love that angel because you said circumvent and that's what P purple paradise resort is all about. We're going to circumvent a whole lot of systems and I don't want to fight anybody. I'm, I'm one of you. I'm an anarchist. I didn't even know what that was when I <laughs> when I became an anarchist. But uh, even years ago, I remember going to work, paying bills, getting up to go the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and going, something's wrong with this. Something is so wrong with this because I wasn't having any fun. I, I liked my job, but it, you know, day in and day out, over and over and over. And I'm thinking, I, I wasn't born for this. I'm not, I'm not supposed to be doing this. But here I am many years later, and uh, David has a little idea of where I'm at right now financially. <laughs> you know, But I am unbanked. I, 
uh, except for my crypto wallets. Uh, I don't have a bank account. I haven't had one for over five years. Yes, it gets tough sometimes, especially because Belize doesn't accept crypto that I'm aware of, especially in my little town that I'm in, or on, excuse me, on. There's a reason for that. Uh, so, um, yeah, and Kat, you wanted to, wanted us to mention, like, what the financial atmosphere is like where we're, where we're living. Uh, Belize is poverty stricken. I can barely walk out my door without someone asking me for money. It's that bad. And I'm not exaggerating. Um, and I'm in the same boat kind of, you know, I'm trying to build a resort that's going to be totally off the grid and cashless. And I'm not talking credit card. I mean, it is credit card. This is barterless. I, I don't like bondage. I don't, I, I don't see that in the vision. And, um, so yeah, it's going to be, that's why we need fund or yeah, it'll be fully funded. And I haven't, have, this is really oxymoronic, but I, I'm an intermediary for two private placement platforms. And I know that that's how a lot of us are going to be able to fund our projects. And I, if you know what that is, or you want to know what that is, you'll have to contact me because I'm not supposed to broadcast any more information about it than that. But it's pretty big stuff. It's how the rich guys keep getting richer. But anyway, that's how we're going to do the resort. And, um, Oh, my goodness. Uh, Angel, you mentioned taxation. Years ago, um, I was working with a group, and um, I read, well, I went through a lot of the errant sovereign's handbook. I was able to get off the property tax rolls. Didn't help with, my, with the foreclosure that I prevailed for seven years, so they illegally evicted me. Uh, it looked like a SWAT team coming to the house, talk about freaked out. But anyway, um, yeah, so there's a way to do it. And there's also another document called the revocation of um, election. And that gets you off the income tax rolls because it's supposed to be voluntary. And it's a legal document. And I know somebody or I have, I can, I can help anybody that wants to do that. I just connect you to the source that writes the document. That's all um, customized to what you need. Okay, so there's something I want to say just to be really, really clear, because I love these ideas on getting out of the system. Do these things at your own risk. Anarchapoco does not endorse any not action right. that you take because sometimes the SWAT team does show up, you know, and, and I know there's ways like where they see on your birth certificate that you have a bank account. I know a guy who paid off his car, got the title. And it got impounded, you know? Yep. So like these things often are maybe philosophically, maybe even legally in alignment with truth, but sometimes in function and practicality, that SWAT team shows up. So I just have to say well, that, that was so that over, people that know. That was over a foreclosure though. Yeah, that was over a foreclosure. No, I understand. But as far as I the property all these taxes. Out of income tax, all of that. Yeah, well, as far as... I mean, it, these are legal things that we can do, and, and it doesn't, the problem is it doesn't always work for everybody, and I don't have an answer for that. Like, my county was a was just as corrupt as any other county, but when I did all the, uh, the documentation to get off the, the property tax rolls, um, my, I, I did it. I, I didn't pay taxes for four or five years on my property, but my neighbor who was in the next county he did the same paperwork and it didn't work for him. He, they wouldn't even take a filing. And it's, you know, it's just a corrupt system. So, um, yeah, you know, it's in circumventing the resort will be under a natural law trust, which is a Commonwealth trust so that we get to do what we want to do without intervention. And, um, Ken, I love the stuff that you were talking about. Um, one thing, if the grid goes down, and I don't have one because I really don't have anything in my wallet, my, my wallet's right now, but um, is an external um, Bitcoin wallet. And I don't know, the Taser, was, I forget the name of a Teaser or Trazer or something. Trazer. Trazer. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah, yeah that's, I'm not sure that that's still available because I heard some bad things about that a couple years ago. But, you know, there's there are things that you can do. Um, I want the resort to be totally off the grid because we're not going to be paying any bills. So that's so my thing. 
Here's the thing about the grid going down um, that I think is really important. And it's for me, like, huh, my question about crypto is, yeah, eventually it'll come back up. But what we have is a faith-based money. And when things like that happen, I think the equivalent of what happens in a bank run, I mean, it's not exactly the same thing, um, is what happens. And uh, But the, the loss of faith in the money that occurs in a bank run when people are like, wait a minute, I might not be able to access my money. Let me go get it right now and, and have control of it. With crypto, if you have the, system, the grid go down, um, that brings to the four people's mind that, wow, I don't have any way to trade. And so that's why commodities money, I think, is really important to have a you know, diversification. We should have this free market, free system where people understand money and they understand that like crypto, just having these dollars, right? That's, that's not really what trade is about. What trade is about is be, having something that is in demand. And some things will always be in demand and some things don't require any kind of a faith or belief in the money, it's what it is, right? And it could be gold, it could be silver, it could be eggs. Um, but what you really want is for the money to not be like a, a highly perishable item, right? You don't want it, you don't necessarily want to store, like to be amassing large amounts of eggs. <laughs> um, and so that's why it's very, that's why gold and silver, like thinking about that, adding that into your real world store of value so that when these monies that require our faith um, are put to the test, you have something to fall back on. Yeah. yeah, I think that's really important, the decentralization aspect. And um, just one note on the property tax aspect is that you can become a nomad. I live here in the Bitcoin.com bus. It's a little tiny house. It's on wheels. And I don't have to pay property tax, you know, I'm nomadic and you can move to a state where there is no property tax. And I think it's always important to think of long and short term. If you have 150 chickens producing, you know, 125 eggs a day. Yeah. In the short term, you've got a great ecosystem going. And if you've got water stored up and a bunch of cigarettes bought and gold and silver, and these different things, then you can accommodate for any level of need when it comes to your exchange rates. What were you going to say, David? Well, I was going to talk about how um, the grid going down because, again, I'm in California and this thing went down. I was up in Mendocino maybe a few weeks ago when we were coming down. And so we were going down to the freeway. And like while we're coming down, all these people are coming up, they turned off the electricity. You can't even go get gas. And so I was with a bunch of Freedom guys, which was good. But then we went to the gas station and there's like 20 cars backed up and the, like one car tried to get in front of the other. And the lady came out there and she was like, we've been standing in line and this and that. And I'm like, this is a glimpse of the apocalypse. When the shit goes down, <laughs> people go crazy, man. They go crazy. So the other side of it is that you want to have good moral people around you. And this is a whole nother conversation. <laughs> but they freak out because there is such a reaction. This is the consumerism model. Buy the stuff, that's it. Work, buy the stuff, that's it. Buy the but there's nothing like uh, investing or planting and waiting and sitting like a farmer would and having some basic morality. So like, like I thought I saw what Michael said, like having skills and abilities plus a network of people that you know are good people, like is like one of the best lifesavers. Like you can call up, you know, Captain or Angel, and be like, "Hey, this grid's down. Um, I got some gas. Can I come over and like dig ditches for you, or like can I come like do something, or like do some marketing, or do some writing? Like, does you know we got to figure some, figure it out together? But if you're with a super statist, then they're going to be like waiting on the police to come or the fire people to come. But it's like at the end of the day. We are evolving. This is what we're trying to do is to take ownership of our life mm -hmm. and to be intentional, to build positive relationships with people because the state, these guys, they caused 9-11, they dropped bombs, they killed a million Iraqis in the last 15 years in the, in the Middle East over there. They are cycles at the highest level. So they have no morals and we cannot count on them at all. So this is the side note, but then like as it relates to the state having – digital currency that's another like i'm like oh my gosh angel i see it because you have like apple pay google pay 
And, um, mm-hmm. you know, you just scan your phone, right? I'm like, oh, man, this is not good, dude. Like, this is slowly. Hey, babe, yeah. Have you seen the under the skin wallets they're coming up with now? No. no. I, I saw the image. I didn't yeah. see the actual thing. Do they have, like, I've seen the RFID chip, but they got wallets under the skin? Yeah, so that you can pay for your goods with your wrist. Dude, but, that's, not, that's not good at all. So, like, so how to communicate with new friends, right, people that are awake. Like some of our family members, you know, we give them the facts. They're not interested. We'll say, hey, shit's going down. It's not good. We got to like prepare all oh, this and that. Don't worry about that. I'm like, okay, dude. So this is why I love Narcopoco. And I come back every year to make new friends and be like, okay, I can trust this person. Okay, I can trust that person. Okay, we can build something together <laughs> because I don't want to be stranded in, uh, in this city. There's no food. And it's like I have no plan. So how to be proactive in this and then – I'm not going to leave my family behind, but I got to take care of numero uno first. And then I can bring them along with me and say, Hey, I prepared a place for you. I was planning. I knew she was going to be bad and that's okay. You know, all your bank accounts got frozen or seized or the dollars um, worthless, which is another opportunity. So the state, they are criminal. They have a lot of money. They have a lot of force, but when that U S dollar crashes, this is going to be a very big opportunity for us to seize whatever we're going to seize, whether it's the people's intentions or goodwill, but like they don't have like mass control, of like the human spirit, right? Like mm-hmm. talking with people, can not mention the education process. If you sit down with somebody one-on-one or one on five or whatever you do to go out there and talk about it, just speaking about it is like serving humanity of letting them know what's coming because they have that 2030 goal you know, Agenda 2030 and the carbon taxes just painted a mural of Greta Thunberg in San Francisco. It was like, oh, God, these guys are out of control and they're not going to stop. So having good people, building some skills, and uh, you mentioned the silver and such, but, like, having good relationships, I think, that was, like, almost the currency in and of itself. I yes. love that, David. I think that is so important. So I saw in the comments – If you are wanting to chime in or ask a question on any of our mediums, you can go ahead and ask a question, leave a comment. We're going to bring up Moose, and I want to mention that we are at the top of the hour. The conversation seems to be flowing, so as long as we're going with the flowing, we will keep the conversation happening here for a little bit. And I would love it if people in the comments would write where they are from. So if you are on YouTube or Facebook or here on Zoom, you would just type in where you are in the world. This is such a fascinating thing. And Moose, are you here with your mic unmuted? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi. Welcome. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. The feedback with Zoom, it's hard. It's kind of disorienting because I can't hear myself talk. But yeah, I just brief uh, kind of reiterate what everyone said with the inflation, property tax, and why it's cruel. I have lots of discussions with coworkers. Um, if I, well, quick about language, it's funny. Um, I've done lots of reading, anything from like Mein Kampf to the Road to Serfdom, and it's funny to see how language can be twisted. But what I found, like with meanings, like you have credit or whatever, the intent or belief people have with what they're speaking, I find at work, even though I may not have the definitions that they want, makes it easy. So one of the things we talked about at work was it was some of my coworkers, as my older supervisors, like I'm like I don't get property tax. I'm like, what about the people like you saved up, you retire, and I have no more income or whatever you saved up on your, so you have your little house, your land, your farm, so you have no more money coming in. But each year the property value goes up. It's like wait, but then they want more money from you, but you're not able to compensate for it. It's like does no one see that that's weird or wrong? It's like how does you're completely self-sufficient and do everything yourself. So you help people too. It's like that whole concept of like, can you really, uh, it just seems strange to me. I'm, I'm not that old. I'm 27 and I, I grew up in the middle of the woods. I've been around the world. I've worked, I've made bad choices. Unfortunately I served like different things, but like that concept of property and ownership, it's like, and property taxes, like, and all of a sudden my dollar is worth less and less and inflation. And it's, I just was wanted to reiterate that and like how despite what it may seem like in the world and all how they may take the language and the words and the meanings, having these conversations with just people around you and all of this topic, if you believe you're right and you believe in the truth, like it doesn't matter how many definitions they change. But yeah, that was it. I want to keep listening to everybody else. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Wow. 
No, Moose, because you're speaking to me. Because if there is one thing I want to leave everyone here with today, it is that the property tax might be the absolute worst tax because you're never getting out of it, right? And because, well, because you, you could just not own property, but the whole point is that you, if you want to set down roots, if you want to build something for your family, if you want to create a business, if you want to invite people onto your property, if you want to have any kind of freedom, you are not going to be allowed to do that because of the property tax. And it's really interesting because it hurts it hurts more people than it helps. And I, I really, there, Deborah Medina a few years back ran in Texas um, for governor, I think, and one of the, her platform was to get rid of the property tax. And then, of course, everyone was like, oh, but the schools, oh, but the children. But it really, I don't think people really grasped that this would be a way for them to really have something something in the future. We're all talking about how people, how the elderly, like, what are we going to do? There's this crisis and, you know, they, they can't have, in, they are, we're living longer, but then there are no incomes and they have property and they're getting pushed out of their property because they can't afford the taxes when property taxes rise, right? Because of property values. It's so crazy that it's tied that way, but it's really meaningful that it's tied that way. Um, it affects, um, and this is also why you see people complaining a lot about gentrification. It's really the property tax that's the problem and not who's moving in or why. In any event, but I do want people to understand that that's the tax that makes it impossible for us to free ourselves, to create our own communities that are independent of government. And so I think it's a very um, purposeful, intentional tax by government. And I don't think it's one they will give up easily. Um, oh, they, so they love it. They absolutely love it. And the fact that you have to keep paying it after you paid off your house is a direct logical way that they're saying we own your house you bought it but we're going to collect residuals for infinity and then like you mentioned the schools so this goes into some of my you know wheelhouse the schools are teaching you obedience to the state so it's this continual cycle they fund themselves and if you look into the book of the history of schooling by um I can't think of the name right now, but 1932, um, Coverly, El Elwood P. Coverly, he said in his own book, once we got the property taxes to fund the schools, we knew we had hit gold. So it was a really strange um, way to express it and say like it was this was like a, a windfall. So I'm very interested. And Jen was talking about that, how to uh, uh, circumvent the property taxes because they're not going to stop. You know, they, they're just uh, criminals. And despite there being some nice people within government and within the school system and within the police, it's all based on coercion. And how can we do that? Hey, maybe it is going to be through the crypto. Maybe it is going to be the barter. And the word agorism, like I didn't even come across this word, Catherine, until maybe just a couple of years ago. And I'm like, what the heck is that? But it's like the, the black market, the intentional circumvention and diversion of economy that's like monitored or regulated by the state and through like underground maybe we can kind of cover some of that or, or what do you think about the maybe some of that alg algorithm, algorithm talk there okay first before we talk about that i found a list if for united states residents of the lowest property tax rates in case you're looking okay so According to this website, worldpopulationreview.com, this is the ranking in reverse order. I'm going to give you the top 10 places to be looking, according to this website, okay? <laughs> Hawaii, Alabama, Louisiana, Colorado, Delaware, South Carolina, West Virginia, Wyoming, Arkansas, and Utah. Keep in mind, this is at the state level. There may be local property taxes. That's how it is done in Texas. And Alabama also has the lowest medium cost of housing. So you combine the lowest cost to buy a house with the best property tax freedom eligibility. Just a little note I wanted to give you. Agorism. So agorism is the black and gray market. And it is my jam. It is my favorite place to be. I like to exist there. I like to dance there. I like to play there. It's where I want to be forever and always. I got into agorism at the Porcupine Freedom Festival in New Hampshire. They have this thing 
called Agora Valley. It used to be Agora Alley. And it is it was just a bunch of us sitting at picnic tables vending, right? And then eventually it turned into this giant section of the campground. And at Agora Valley, vendors accept barter, silver, gold, crypto, all sorts of things that you could trade with. And it's a really fun place to first start experimenting with a free and open market. And I wish I had some right here uh, in front of me. Um, I've got some in my backpack over there. But there's these things that people have created mm -hmm. called silver dime cards I where they have actually laminated. I do hear someone in the background. FYI, mute your mic if you've if you're got some things going on. Um, but they take these cards, they punch out a dime-sized hole, and they put in a piece of junk silver, like I referred to it earlier, which is our old money that was actually printed on silver which i believe is all is it pre-1964 and these silver dimes are laminated into the card and people put all sorts of cool logos on them and usually at the event the event community sets a flat rate for it so the last time i went i think it was like a three dollar card the year before that it was a five dollar card it's just based on the going rate of silver at the time right but to make it easy so that you're not pulling up the, the silver calculator app on your phone which does exist if you want to get into barter um if you pull up the silver calculator app you know sometimes like it's not a straight you know 250 or three dollars and so at Porkfest, they will just kind of round to the nearest one and use that as a placeholder during the event. And these are really cool to collect too. So not only can you collect pieces of silver and gold or bronze from all over the planet, you know, um, you can also collect these silver dime cards. And some of them were with the uh, junk silver. And then they also have these ones that are made with little tiny strips of gold or little tiny strips of silver. The problem with that is that those are easier to counterfeit or plagiarize, right? Because they're under there. It's easier with the junk silver because you can see that it was minted and it's a lot easier to tell if it's a false. And so when we're talking about the black and gray market and agorism, this kind of expands beyond money itself and also into things like licensing. So this means like if your state requires you to get a license to cut someone's hair and you're just cutting hair in exchange for money or exchange for barter, exchange for whatever, you're an agorist because you're existing in the gray market, right? It's not unlawful necessarily to be cutting hair but you're violating a statute or a regulation and they're gonna fine you right they're not gonna necessarily come put you in jail um you know for cutting someone's hair but they might fine you and of course the inevitable conclusion if you don't pay the fines you know we know where that story leads us to so agorism is really the free market in the most simplest of terms it is you and i exchanging value for value and that could be time it could be energy it could be items it could be skills like we were talking about earlier like i know that i will never be without because i'm a talented human being and i have worked hard to learn and to expand my mind and i know that i'll never be without because i have strong relationships because i've worked hard to cultivate relationships and to work through hard times and to communicate honestly and openly and to function with integrity and to own my mistakes and to evolve, right? David, you already hit on that. That is our theme for this year. And I was actually just talking to Jessica who runs the event about how cool it is that all of us participating in Erica Poco this year, this has been our mantra, evolve, evolve, evolve. We're saying it all the time. We're reading it all the time. It's in all of our literature. It's just being said over and over and over. And I feel like 2019 has been a year of evolution for me. I don't know about the rest of you. So when we're talking about money and we're talking about banking systems and we're talking about trade, for me, it always comes down to the least common denominator, which is you and the person standing next to you. And if you can get it down to that, if you can cut out the middleman, whoo, now we're talking about freedom, right? And that doesn't mean that there won't be a need for currency of some sort, right? Decentralize, decentralize, decentralize. Okay, so I want to check in with everyone. How are we doing? Are people still feeling like talking? Angel, I see you are. 
Yeah, I will say about agorism, one of the things I think is valuable about people engaging in agorism is the the connection, making that connection again of, of what money is. Because once you start, in, start engaging in trade and really experiencing some of the problems of trade, which is like what I said, like, oh, I, I really want that ball, but you really don't want my perfume. We've got a problem. You start... <laughs> Right, you start to realize that, like, ah, oh, um, we need something else, and then, and I feel like, you know, with like David said, you know, the you, the school has take the schools have taken over education, and I mean, not the schools, the state has taken over education, and it's not in the interest of the state to really teach kids about money in a, in an earnest way, and we don't really understand it, and God, who knows what would happen if they go to cashless. I mean, there's uh, like what people would think about money. But if you have an, if you are engaging in agorism, then you start to really understand what this means, what trade is. And I think that's important because people have this idea that money is evil um, as if it just is like in and out, like it's like the, like people think about the gun, right? Like if it's <laughs> like, it's the problem and not like, the, what's around it and when people say they want money they don't really want money they don't care anything about money what they care about is the things they can get with money right we want to be able to trade as we well we want to be able to get as much things as much stuff out of society as we can and the way to that right now is money and so just all of these connections with what this act what it actually is that's why um like people will say money is the root of all evil, which is crazy because that's sh it's just the desire for us to trade things. Greed is pretty bad. That's when you want to trade. That's when you want to get as much as you can, probably more than you should be getting, but don't want to give in return. Um, and so that that's the value I see in agorism because on the, on the small scale locally, it really works, but we're talking, we're talking about changing the entire world. And so we need systems and that's where things like crypto will come in. That's where things like understanding that you need commodity based money um, for savings will come in. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We are. Absolutely. Yeah. I have to add to that. Um, we are trying to change the world and I should say improve the world, make it a better place, but it's through our own circles, our own actions in ourselves that we can become the model, right? So this is one of the revelations that I had is like, we got, you know, we got the ideas, but then there's a indoctrination program that's been working for years. It's intergenerational. So we have to be thinking at least intergenerationally about freedom so that children can begin to realize Hey, I own myself, and this is why the parenting, you know, stuff is so important. And what's so un unbelievable about the schools, I saw something about there was a, a seventh grade textbook article curriculum, and it's a question. It says, if you were the CEO of a tech company and you wanted to persuade people to get a microchip for, you know, doing transaction, what would you tell the people so they would get it? I'm not kidding. That was part of the curriculum. So you have the state who's actually putting their program into our children. And so the only way we counter that is to transcend and to put something superior to that, that, hey, you're free, you own yourself, and the, the education is what you do yourself to create a good life, right? I think this is the conversation of like becoming an educated person. It's not something that somebody else does to you or to me. In fact, you can't even give your child a good education. You can give them the condition to educate themselves you, of love, acceptance, support, you know, like you're the safety net. But if they don't want it, they can't get it. Same thing like a gym membership. You can give someone a gym membership, but if they don't want to be healthy, they got to go do the work. That's up to them to do that. And so just the, um, the duplication process, I think, is really powerful. And then helping people become powerful where they are. Like the, uh, the Titanic, if you're the ship boat on the Titanic, the captain, you turn the boat, the, the wheel, it doesn't turn immediately. It takes a long time for the ship to turn. So I think in having a kind of a long-term perspective, it's a balance, you know, work hard and try to do the best we can today and then have a 20-year vision or a goal because these guys aren't stopping and um, the need to exchange is really powerful. So that's what's so attractive about the agorism is to be intentional and then there's one resource that I really love. It's called 
198 Nonviolent Methods by Gene Sharp because we don't realize how powerful the money is. So I want to support voluntarists or freedom people or anarchists. So if somebody is selling gas or materials for the house or whatever, I want to go support those people. So just like I was saying earlier, having a list of vendors that accept crypto, we can have a list of businesses or entrepreneurs that are pro freedom. And I want to go buy their goat milk or cheese or, you know, whatever we want to buy. So we can take the money away from the super statists who are voting for all these crazy things and kind of starve them and, uh, and then give it to people who are pro peace and pro freedom and like love and true voluntary relationships. And that's a way, cause I don't want to be in the streets either, but, um, you know, we're seeing what's happening in Hong Kong for six months in where else is it all these different countries china um all these places that are, are going on and because people are like we are mad and we want you guys to do something it's like no those are the guys that cause the problems what you want to do is withdraw your cooperation and begin to participate with people that are pro-peace pro-voluntary relationships so it's kind of the the idea war and the economic war in being intentional with the exchanges and with helping people understand the ideas. And it's just so liberating for me. Once I learned I own myself, I was like, really? Like, I felt like, like I was like blasphemous or something because it is right. The state is a religion. I'm like, man, I own myself. Wow. That's crazy. Like I'm not bound to somebody unless I sign a contract with them. Damn, man, this is insane. So just that final like underlying that um, freedom is the, the issue of our lifetime and how to help people do it economically and also philosophically. Yes, David, I really feel like if health is the foundation of personal freedom, I feel like economic freedom is the foundation for a community and for a society. And if we can keep ourselves healthy and we can barter and trade with each other, we are functionally free. That's really what it came, comes down to. Michael Nimitz, I see that you had your hand up. Would you like to chime in here? You might be on mute. Yeah, I just wanted to add some things that Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Hello. I can hear you. We can hear. Thanks again. Uh, I just wanted to add some things in regard to the agorist uh, ideas, and, and uh, you know, the, I think one of the real benefits of uh, coming down to Acapulco is really an opportunity to witness a, a different culture, and you know, I think the uh, Acapulcanos in particular are one in which they are uh, agorist in a lot of ways because they, you know, they're much more attuned to seeing value in the quality of life and stuff that I think many of the, you know, the modern Western kind of societies that are uh, so reliant on money uh, kind of miss because we, we kind of get blind to what we don't pay for as being valuable. You know, especially like when it comes to like caring about each other and stuff like that. You know, if, if nobody's paying for us to be caring to each other, then, hey, we just don't do it, you know. But there's a, there's a great book that I got rec uh, that was recommended by Marshall Rosenberg, the guy that uh, founded NBC, called uh, Punish, Punished by Rewards by, I think it's Alfie Cohn. And, you know, money kind of functions as kind of that, that way of like creating a reward behind something that's valued that kind of hides the real value of things and when we become so used to like a monetary system you start to lose the connection between what's really valuable and what is paid for and, and that just gets more and more perverse and so this is one of the things that i think uh, people can really uh, grasp here in, in Acapulco and, and taking a little time. And I encourage people to come down and spend, you know, a little bit of extra time, not just during the, the conference, but before or after, to really kind of see the culture and how, you know, how much they understand real value so much better. And, and you know, like things that might cost or you may not be able to get, you might be able to get for 10 pesos or something here that you know that they, they, they've kind of created the circumstance where they they really start to see all the little things that are valuable, and, and you know kind of create that 
opportunity that, you know, maybe we don't notice these things, but these are things that if we can take it back to our community, we, you know, entrepreneurs can start to see, hey, there's a lot of other things that are valuable. And this is also something about uh, kind of the psychology of fear and the fear of failure. Uh, I was just, I'm doing the uh, autonomy course, uh, which is something new in, the, in our community. And uh, I'm highly, re I highly recommend it because it's really opening my eyes to a lot of things. But one of the things is, you know, uh, they use fear and fear of failure to really mask what we understand is value. And we can, if we understand that there are opportunities behind the things that we irrationally fear, and that also that failure is kind of the building block for success, we can really change our attitude and mindset and really the community's mindset by becoming examples of how to become a really anti-fragile community of people that just don't, don't give up, you know, because we understand that, you know, the, most of the control mechanism is based on fear, but that's really just a hindrance to, in a, in a you know, a curtain that really hides tons of opportunity and tons of value in, you know, in what I would call the invisible economy that agorists are just starting to chip away at. But man, I'm, I'm telling you, there's all kinds of valuable things that we have within ourselves and our skills and abilities that we can give to other people and that we can uh, provide to other people that can change the quality of life within our community that can really, you know, really draw people to us because we're delivering things that nobody else has even thought about. No. Yeah, I think you bring up some really good points. And um, Michael, you introduced me to an idea when I was there in Acapulco that I would like to share with the community, if you don't mind. So I was recording a video for a training I did on detoxing your whole life at Michael's house. Thank you so much. I haven't published it yet, but I have it done and it's gorgeous. Your home is gorgeous. I'm so grateful. And we had this amazing conversation where Michael was talking to me about how the human brain can really only retain around 150 names at a time, right? Once you hit like that 151, you're kind of like, ah, what's their name? You know, you're grabbing for it. You're grabbing for it. So he said to me, why not make these 150 names that I'm able to retain the highest caliber people on the planet? Why not buy my coffee from the most amazing coffee person? Why don't I rent an Airbnb from the most amazing person who owns a home? Why don't I take yoga from the most interesting yoga person I've ever met in my life? And it really got me thinking about how our relationships really are a currency and how we really do build economy by supporting each other. And whether it's through barter, through trade, or just spending good old USD fiat money, when we are supporting one another, we are strengthening our community and we are becoming more strong and more resilient in all of these things we've been talking about today, whether it's, you know, the, the grid going down or just functioning in everyday life, we can do it better. And as Angel would say, more excellent. I love excellence and I love it. Angel's been bringing that to my attention because we really can do life in a more excellent way by being good to one another and spending money with one another. So I want to check in. I haven't seen any more questions coming in in the comments. So Angel, David, how do you feel about doing some closing thoughts here? Yeah. Okay. Who there wants we, to go first? Yeah, we've been for 90 minutes. Absolutely. So talking about money, the importance of it and growing freedom worldwide. Anarchy means no rulers. You rule yourself. We self-govern. These ideas are spreading worldwide. And we're so grateful to talk about how it evolves the economy using a meeting of exchange, exchanging value for value, whether it's a piece of paper or some gold or some crypto or some code. The state is organized crime that forces us to use certain currencies and it's no longer acceptable. And so you can see here now there's 20 or 30 of us, people, hundreds of people watch this. There'll be thousands of people in an Acapulco in three months. I invite you to come down and check it out. I've gone every year 
from 120 to 300 to 600 to 1200. And guess what? It gets it better. And so if you want to start your own event, there's a little link on there. Get involved. You can start your own event. We'll promote you. But um, I would say, like you said, let's give our money to good people. And if we can, withdraw from people that are criminals and begin to be conscious about our purchases and just understand that just because we violate their laws that we didn't agree to doesn't make us the bad guy. It makes them the bad guy. They, vi they violated their constitutional oaths. And so we want to evolve beyond statism, evolve beyond coercive individuals and organizations. And you all are part of that solution. You all are my hope. And so some of my friends, some of the people I want to build relationships with. And so I hope you'll join us next week. I don't know what we're talking about, but it's going to be freaking awesome. And uh, I'm very excited that, that we have our team together and some of the people behind the scenes working hard. Um, but it just takes a lot of work um, to do all these things. And so I hope you guys seize the moment. We're literally 90 days away from the health stuff, the crypto, the family things. Um, so many cool things that you can bring back to your location and maybe start your own event or community or something powerful to help be the light and show other people the next evolution of human consciousness is voluntarism and anarchy. That's what I believe. <laughs> hey, so, uh, Evan, I'm always just smiling when I listen to you talk because I love your enthusiasm. <laughs> and it makes me want to come hang out with you. At El <laughs> That's okay. Um, My name is David, but we love, Evan, we love you oh, too, bro. Oh. We miss you, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's late here. It's been a day. Um, <laughs> And, and, uh, and I have my mind full of all of these things that, that I want to say, wanted to say, want to unpack for people. And so what I think I want to do is just to say the financial system is such a huge part of money. Economy is such a huge part of, uh, of anarchism, of liberty. And a lot of the arguments against anarchy and liberty um, are, are in the direction of but what about what about the economy and what about money and what about and all the ways that it can't work in a state of liberty and so it's really important that people do understand the arguments for um, free economies and and so I'm glad that Kat went ahead and posted the link for um, for man economy state which is a big one but for what has government done for to our money because it's um it's a short book it's really short you could read it in an afternoon but it really lays out the the details from start to finish about what money is and how governments have overtaken money and how they've changed money the shape of money the shape of what we think money is and the effects and and it's so interesting i was listening to it recently to hear rothbard talking about the bailouts about the bailout that would inevitably come and i'm thinking back to a few years ago and going the Austrians were right, but they never say the Austrians were right. They never acknowledge what the pe what the advocates of freedom have been telling them, even when it proves to be correct. So if you want to be one of the people who can go, look, we said this, and look at what's happening, definitely what has government done to our money? And you can also listen to it online, too. So if you Google and find the audio, if you're a person like me who likes to listen to those things. So I'll say that. Go get educated so you understand and you can take that information forward, teach your kids, teach your community, and um, and then uh, we can all sit around and discuss and really get into the nitty-gritty at uh, Anarchapulco. So I hope to see all of you there. Yes, everyone. Anarchapulco this year is going to be amazing. It's amazing every year, but this year we have spent so much time building community together on these calls. I want to mention that we had people list in the Zoom. I didn't see all the comments from Facebook and YouTube. We had people from Mexico, the East Coast of the United States, Texas, California, Guatemala, Belize, Netherlands. We have an international community that all converge together in Acapulco, Mexico once a year. It is an amazing experience. Next week, we are going to be talking about my favorite subject anarchy and a healthy lifestyle health and wellness is my jam this is the ecosystem that i manage for anarcha poco and the anarch awakened stage we are going to be talking about gmos and food safety organics vegetarian and veganism and carnivorism i'm going to add that in there i'm a vegetarian but there are health arguments and of course ethical arguments that should be discussed about 
eating or not eating meat, processed foods, yoga, healthy lifestyles in general, this is a conversation you are not going to want to miss. I am so excited about this. I have been working really hard on getting the health and wellness stage put together. We've got a practitioner space this year managed by Dr. Buckley. He was on one of our calls previously. He's awesome. He's very accessible. He is a healer in his own right, but there is a whole group of practitioners coming. So you are going to be able to get treated by anarchist doctors from around the world who are doing all sorts of cool things like stem cell drips. So some final thoughts. Hotel rooms are available today and we will sell out because this year the hotel is going to be under construction. We're not going to hear the noise. They're going to cease it, but some of the rooms are going to be blocked off. So if you want to get a hotel, and my personal recommendation as someone who has stayed off-site and on-site, especially if you have children, great to stay in the hotel because everything is easily accessible. It is fantastic to stay in the hotel. There are multiple swimming pools there. It's right on the beach. All of our conference rooms are spread out really nicely. It's a really great place to stay. And it is so nice to get on that elevator and know that the person standing next to you is an anarchist because we rent the whole grounds out. So everywhere you go, you are looking at fellow voluntarists and fellow anarchists, which is a really neat experience. We've already announced the main stage and Dollar Vigilante speakers. You can find those at anarchpoco.com. Stay tuned because we have some big announcements coming up. I can't wait to tell you all about the health and wellness stage. It's going to be so cool this year. I'm really pumped up about it. I've been working so hard. I want to tell you about it right now, but I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. Okay. There's all sorts of great information on the website. We have a really cool blog. Angel's been editing that. We've got writers contributing stories. There is the ability for you to submit an article. If you have a guest post you'd like to submit, we would love to hear from you. Angel has been just calling in the articles, calling in the articles. So if you like to write, go ahead and see if you can get published on anarchaboga.com. We want to hear what you have to say. You can also find articles and pages about what to expect while you're there, frequently asked questions. We are posting updates every single week on the blog. Now, there is a way for you to monetize your experience with Anarchapoco, and that is through our affiliate program. So if you go to anarchapoco.com and you click Get Involved, this is a way for those of us who are just so excited about Anarchapoco that we can't stop talking about it everywhere we go, to make a little money on the side, and it gets a discount for your friends. So this is a really way, great way for you to get involved, maybe pay for your ticket, maybe more if you have a really big network and you're really talking about it. And I will tell you, this year... Everywhere I go, people are talking about Anarchapoco. Everywhere I go. I've never heard such a buzz about this event. You know, I'm going to events that are kind of similar to Anarchapoco, but they're super niche, you know, whether it's a psychedelic conference or an unschooling conference, and people are talking about Anarchapoco. They are coming. People are coming. So this is a good year if you want to get involved with the affiliate program. This is a really good year to do that. So go to anarchapoco.com, click on Get Involved, and there you can suggest speakers. You can sign up to volunteer. You can submit your to become a performer now we are tying everything up in neat little bows right now so you know bear in mind that might have to be for 2021 so thank you guys everybody for joining us from youtube from facebook from d live from twitch from twitter here on zoom we are so grateful to have your attendance we are so grateful that you are part of the conversation i hope this was in, as enlightening for you as it was for me i really cherish these tuesday nights with you guys it makes me feel like i'm coming home to my family and i am so grateful for you taking the time and energy to participate so thank you guys from all of us here at anarchapoco peace love and anarchy <laughs>